Managing Martin Down, Chasing Sheep, Bashing Scrub, and Counting Butterflies, presented by Mike Fussell, Countryside Ranger for Hampshire County Council Countryside Services. The Chalkdown Nature Reserve features impressive archaeology, rare flowers, birds, and insects. In this talk, Mike Fussell outlines the work being done to look after them and discusses future challenges and opportunities across this unique area. And good evening, everybody. Um, can we have the first slide, please? Um, so Martin Down is a national nature reserve that's about 10 miles west of Salisbury. Uh, it's in Hampshire, but only just. It's right on the border with Dorset and Wiltshire. Uh, if you know the reserve, this is a view from the Second World War um, rifle range, the big stop butt looking south. And you get an idea of what the landscape is like. It's fairly open grassland with lots of patches of scrub and little bits of woodland. Martin Down is a site of special scientific interest and its habitats include chalk downland or chalk grassland rather, scrub habitats, chalk heath and woodland. It's owned uh, by three different organisations. The southern part is owned by Natural England, the middle bit by Hampshire County Council and the bit of sort of woodland and scrub to the north of the A354 is owned by the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Naturalist Trust. But the whole site, all three bits of it, are managed as one unit by Natural England and Hampshire County Council. And uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, you might see me on the reserve uh, or you might see my Natural England colleague, James Plunkett. Uh, the management is also sort of carried out by lots of other people. Um, we have graziers, we have volunteers, um, and we have some commoners too, who have sheep on the down. Can I have the next slide, please? So Martin Down, as Roland mentioned, is full of archeology. span uh, We've got Neolithic, a Neolithic long barrow. Uh, we've got lots of round barrows, rims ditches, there's a Bronze Age enclosure. And we've got the Bockley Dyke, which this is the picture of, which snakes for the whole length of the reserve along the Hampshire Dorset border. The Bockley Dyke was built probably in the Iron Age. Uh, but not on the scale it is now. It was made much bigger by the Romans when the Romans came. The Bockley Dyke is, well, probably one of our, it, it, keep, it sort of, um, what can I say? It, it's got very good sort of um, flora, partly because it's been there. It's, well, sorry, I'm stumbling over my words here. We've done some clearance on the Bockley Dyke, as you can see, this, is, this was cleared about two years ago, this bit. We don't want to allow the scrub and trees to develop too much on the dike or any of the archeology span because the roots can damage the archeology. span And also you can see the form of the structures much more clearly if they're free of vegetation, uh, well, say of, of tall vegetation. On the Bockley Dyke, um, there is actually a post which Roland has put in, which if you, have, if you go to uh, the app, which has been set up by the Landscape Partnership, you can find out information about the archaeology. And I believe you can also see a video of um, a reconstruction of Roman soldiers walking along the top of the, Ro of the Bockley Dyke. So if you, if you go to the the Bockley Dyke where it sort of meets up with the rifle range, you'll find that post. You just need your mobile phone to access that. Uh, next slide, please. So 
We also have a, a Roman road running across the reserve. This is the Roman road that runs from uh, Old Sarum to Badbury Rings, the Ackling Dyke. Uh, and we also have lots of, well, one of the protected species we have on the site is the Roman snail, which may or may not have been introduced by the Romans when they came, but it may be more of a coincidence that it's, it's here and not far from the Roman road. Next slide, please. Orchids are very popular on the reserve. Lots of people come to see our orchids. Um, on the left, we have the green winged orchid, which is in flower sort of towards the middle and back end of May. And on the right is the burnt tip orchid, which flowers of end of May, beginning of June. Next slide, please. On the left here, we have the greater butterfly orchid, which flowers sort of end of May, beginning of June. And on the right, the pyramidal orchid, which flowers a little bit later, June and into July. Next slide, please. Uh, on the left is the bee orchid, uh, which grows, come, it can pop up pretty much anywhere on the, on the reserve, usually flowering sort of uh, through June, July. And on the right is the really tiny frog orchid, which flowers, it's probably our last, well, not quite, one of our last orchids to flower, flowering sort of any time sort of end of July, August, and into September sometimes as well. I think we have 13 species of orchid on uh, which occurring on the down in total. Next slide, please. Lots of people like the orchids, but actually I prefer some of the smaller uh, plants. I mean, these here on the left, we have the early gentian, which flowers again, sort of end of May time, forming quite, quite a large carpet of flowers, um, on the southern end of the reserve. And on the right hand side is field fleawort, which again is a very rare plant uh, and often found along the Bockley Dyke and along Grimm's ditches. Again, the archaeology providing the right conditions for these rare plants. Next slide, please. Oh, yes. On the left, uh, we have a plant which uh, is called Bastard Toad Flax, a very popular name with school children, I would think. Um, it's a very small sort of prostrate plant creeping across short turf. Um, and on the right, these are down shield bugs. And this is an aggregation of them. The sort of ready colored ones are nymphs. And you can just see that if you can, there are about three or four adults there, which are slightly larger, black with a sort of white edging to their, um, to their body, uh, for want of a better word. And the down shield blood bug feeds solely on bastard toad flax. So the down shield bug dependent on the bastard toad flax, both of them very rare, but found on Martin Down. Next slide, please. Perhaps Martin Down is best known for its butterflies. Um, on the left is the marsh fritillary. Uh, we have about 36 species recorded on the site. Uh, perhaps the sort of most well-known ones being things like the Adonis blue. Um, we also have chalk hill blue, um, green hair streak, dark green fritillaries, um, I won't name them all. And also for birds, so a yellow hammer uh, on the right there. Um, but people will come to see the turtle doves in the summer. Uh, it's a good place for farmland birds like the, um, oh dear, I'm using my train of thought, the corn bunting uh, and gray partridge. That is a sort of, uh, a sort of 
perfect area for those. Next slide, please. But really, it's not all about rare plants and animals. Um, Martin Down is such a large site and it, it has a huge diversity of plants, some of them not rare, but things like on the left here, kidney vetch, which is the food plant for the small blue butterfly, which is on the right, uh, and horseshoe vetch and bird's foot trefoil, none of them especially rare, uh, but fantastic plants for supporting lots of other, lots of insects. Uh, so they're the food plants for butterflies, horseshoe vetch being the food plant for the Adonis blue and the chalk hill blue butterflies, for example. Bird's foot trefoil, the food plant for the common blue butterfly and lots of moths as well. And also, of course, uh, fantastic sources of pollen and nectar for bees and other pollinating insects. On, on the kidney vetch here, we've got a Bombus hortorum, the garden bumblebee. But why, why is Martin Down such a good place for biodiversity, all these wild animals and plants? A number of reasons, I would say. Um, one is the chalk geology. Another would be the fact that much of the down has been unplowed for probably a thousand years. Um, it's common land, which is probably the reason it hasn't been ploughed up and turned into farmland. Uh, and it's been grazed by sheep pretty much continuously for all of that time, for probably a thousand years. So what you've got is a sort of a fairly thin soil with not very many nutrients, which is ideal to support a, a wide diversity of plants. So time and space really, uh, I think are the key things here. Next slide, please. This is a map of the reserve with uh, the, the reserve broken up into compartments. So each of those numbers represents a different compartment on the reserve. Um, in fact, you, you, useful perhaps to um, point out the, the different bits. Uh, so the, the triangle at the top is the bit owned by the Wildlife Trust, the bit we call Kit's Grave. The bit either side of the main road is owned by Hampshire County Council, and then the bit at the southern end is owned by Natural England. During the, and just after the Second World War, uh, some of the down was ploughed up. Um, mainly the areas close to the main road, either side of the main road. So those bits of downland are not as rich as some of the other areas. And the bit across the road, Kit's Grave, was pretty much abandoned in terms of grazing for uh, probably 50 or 60 years. Uh, and as a result, a lot of scrub has developed there. So each of these compartments has got a, uh, a set of sort of management. Um, well, actually, each, each compartment has got a list of interesting features, so interesting species, and it's got a set of sort of management um, techniques that need to be followed. Next slide, please. And probably the most important management that happens on the down is grazing by sheep. Currently, we have about 500 sheep on the down. Um, probably last winter, it would have been more like 800. We reduced the numbers this winter because we had such a dry spring last year and there wasn't as much grass. Many of those sheep will soon be leaving the down um, because we will be, um, we like to graze the whole down in the winter and then during the summer many of the paddocks are ungrazed uh, so that the flowers can uh, flower and set seed. We have, as I mentioned before, 
two commoners on the down who have animals on the down all year round. So we've got about probably say 150 commoners animals. Uh, we have one grazier, Mark Hooper, who has uh, about 150 sheep on the down all year round, and they produce lambs. In fact, these are some of his sheep in the picture here, and they'll be lambing in about probably two, three weeks time. And then those lambs will be turned out on the down. And we have a second grazier, uh, Lauren Millard, who brings sheep on in the winter and uh, removes them sort of in the spring to reduce our numbers. And finally, we have, uh, or Natural England have a flock of about 80 sheep, uh, which are non-breeding sheep and are used on the, the um, the rougher bits of the reserve where uh, it's harder to fence, so on the Bockley Dyke and areas where there are steeper slopes and tighter corners. Next slide, please. These are some of the natural England sheep. Um, as you can see, there are different breeds. We have the, the, the brownie coloured ones are Welsh blacks. The sort of grey ones with white heads are herd wicks. And in the bottom right there, you can just see there's one, a white one with a black face. That's a Derbyshire grit stone. So the different breeds graze in slightly different ways. Uh, and in that way, we, we get a better um, job done. Next slide, please. The down, as I mentioned, is common land, and because of that, we can't use permanent fences within the down. We can have them on the boundaries, but not on the down itself. So we use electric fencing in the form of this flexi net fencing. So James and I spend a lot of our time putting up these fences, uh, moving sheep in, and then we could two, three weeks later, we move the sheep out into a new paddock and take the electric fencing down again. So the landscape looks like it's one big sort of vast open space, uh, but the sheep are just confined into small blocks and moved around the down. The next slide. Oh yeah, this is one of our herd wicks. Um, the, the herdwicks are great at eating scrub. So this one's in a, in a big patch of bramble, uh, nibbling away and doing a great job. Um, there is a downside to the herdwicks though. They are also very good jumpers. And uh, we often have been finding herdwicks outside of the paddock, which is a bit of a problem sometimes. And we do spend quite a bit of time chasing them around. Next slide, please. So this is what much of the down will look like now. So after grazing in the winter, you can see the ant hills very clearly and the vegetation has been taken down. That growth through the summer has been removed and the sort of the dry stems have been, if not eaten, then sort of flattened down and sort of moved out of the way. So that's what we want to see about at this time of year. Next slide. In order that, come the summer, this is what we see a lot across most of the reserve. So by not grazing all year round, by not grazing in the summer, we are leaving the, uh, the plants to flower and set seeds. So in flowering, they're producing uh, a resource for all the insects out there, the bees and the butterflies. Uh, and then when they set seed, those seeds are able to uh, hopefully germinate and produce new plants, but also providing food for birds. We have big flocks of goldfinches, for example, in the, at the end of the summer, making taking advantage of that. Next slide, please. 
We have some experiments going on uh, looking at summer grazing. Uh, on the right hand side of the flexi net fence uh, is an area of the down which has, was not grazed at all in the summer. On the left hand side, we have a, a small area which is part of an experiment where we're trialing summer grazing, uh, not every summer, but doing it one in every three years uh, to see whether we can improve the diversity of the sward. One concern we have with the, the policy of grazing hard in the winter and then removing the sheep in, in the summer and not grazing at all is that we get some of the coarser grass is growing much more strongly and over time, over years or decades even, they start to take over and uh, start to sort of shade out the finer plants, the, the more interesting herbs, if you like. Uh, so we've got an experiment running with uh, CEH, the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, trialling these different grazing regimes. Next slide, please. Uh, so on the left hand side here is uh, a flower head, a red round headed rampion, which needs short turf. So tight grazing every year uh, to produce and round headed rampion is it's fairly common on the downs in Sussex and to the east. Uh, to the west, it's much less common and we've just got a few pockets of it on Martin Down. Uh, again, usually on the archaeological features. Um, on the right hand side is a flower head of field scabious, and sitting on it is a, a pretty rare solitary bee, Andrina hatorfiana, the large scabious uh, mining bee. Uh, and that the, the large scabious mining bee feeds only on the pollen of scabious plants. And field scabious, unlike round-headed rampion, uh, benefits from having uh, or not being grazed too heavily. So you often see it actually along roadside verges and bits of rough grassland. So we do have areas where we have don't graze every year. We may graze every two years, sometimes every three years, sometimes less than that which give plants like this the opportunity to grow and thrive as well, and also obviously support these insects. Next slide, please. And the, other, the beauty of having using FlexiNet fencing means we're very flexible in, in where and when we graze. Um, this slide shows Devil's Bit Scabious in flower, and there's an, that's an Adonis blue uh, nectaring on one of the flowers of the Devil's Bit Scabious. Um, Devil's Bit Scabious doesn't flower until sort of end of August and into September. So we will often, well, we will avoid grazing these areas obviously when it's in flower because we don't want to prevent it from flowering and, and setting seed. Um, the Devil's Bit Scabious is the food plant for the marsh fritillary butterfly. Uh, and at the moment, we are grazing the rifle butts, which are uh, area on Martin Down. But if you, if you go past there, you'll see there's a very odd sort of uh, shaped fence line. It goes in, there's a big finger going into the paddock where, where there's no grazing taking place. So we fenced out an area to allow the devil's bit scabious to grow uh, so that we're making sure we're providing plenty of food plant for the, the marsh fritillary. So each year a different bit will be left ungrazed uh, in that area. Uh, and the FlexiNet fencing gives us that, that ability to do that. Next slide, please. I mentioned that uh, after the Second World War, there were areas of the down which were ploughed up uh, for agriculture, only for about 10 years, and then it ceased again. But that really did have a major impact on the, on the, the plants which were growing there. And those paddocks uh, are dominated by coarse grasses. 
um, like upright broom and false oak grass. Um, and in particular, the two big paddocks to the north of the main road, the A354. They're very big paddocks and they've never really been grazed enough to get control of these coarse grasses. They've been grazed with sheep, but we've never really had enough sheep to be able to do an effective job on it. Um, so with the help of the Landscape Partnership, we've been able to put infrastructure in place to introduce cattle, uh, because cattle graze in a different way to sheep. Sheep are very fussy. They will, they will select the sweetest, juiciest, finest grasses and herbs in the sward, leaving the coarser stuff behind if they can. Um, whereas cattle are more general, they'll, they'll eat pretty much everything in, that's in their path and take it down to a sort of a general level. So they will eat the coarse grasses that otherwise might be left behind by the sheep. And in that way, they'll encourage some of those finer herbs, more interesting plants to grow. The other thing that they will do is they will make a bit of a mess. Uh, and if you go across the road now, you'll see there are a few muddy areas where the cattle have been poaching a bit around where the water trough is. Um, but actually, doing a bit of disturbance in a paddock like that is probably quite a good thing because it opens up the bare soil for seeds to germinate in. So it gives opportunities to those plant, other plants to, to set it to, um, to germinate and to grow uh, and hopefully improve the diversity of, of these paddocks. Next slide, please. So this is one of the, uh, the things that we were able to do with the landscape partnership. So this is a new cattle corral, uh, which was put in place. We couldn't have cattle on, on these paddocks if we didn't have something like this in order to get them in to uh, take care of their welfare. Uh, they have to be TB tested before they go off site. Um, and also simply for loading them onto vehicles. So this is an essential bit of kit really, if we're gonna have the cattle on the site. Next slide. The other issue with cattle was uh, we didn't we don't have water across the whole reserve. There are only a, a couple of places where we have water uh, in terms of mains water. So we rely on uh, dragging water around the reserve for the animals. Uh, and we have bowsers, which we use with the sheep, but cattle drink an awful lot more water than sheep do. And our bowsers weren't big enough to uh, provide enough water for the cattle. So with help from the Landscape Partnership, we bought two new water bowsers uh, and we use them in tandem here uh, so that when one runs out, uh, we don't have to go and get the tractor and drag the bowser down the other side of the reserve, fill it up and bring it back on a, on a Sunday afternoon. We can just swap it over for the other one uh, and then build that into our work plan for the next week. And to give you an idea of how much we've got, we had 20 cattle on um, this winter, they've gone now, um, and they would get through about uh, 5,000 litres of water in just over a week. So it gives you an idea of how much they drink. Next slide, please. So that was chasing sheep. Um, I think the next thing we need to talk about is bashing scrub. So even with all of that grazing, it's not enough really to prevent scrub from developing on the site. So um, on the grassland, we get encroachment of hawthorn and blackthorn and bramble. And we try and uh, keep on top of it uh, with well, work parties like this one. So we have volunteers who will uh, come out and cut scrub with hand tools, so loppers, uh, bow saws, and help with burning up the, uh, the arisings. This is a, a group working in the Bockley Dyke, 
earlier this year, we did actually manage to get a volunteer group out despite COVID in the, in the um, summer period. Now, when was it? I, I can't remember when we managed to do this, but we did. We had them out uh, at some stage when the, the rules must have been relaxed enough. We had small groups. Uh, and uh, obviously we'll be you know, looking to get volunteers involved more once COVID is finished. So if you're interested in volunteering, um, please do get in touch. So as I mentioned, we have volunteers uh, helping to cut scrub. Uh, we also uh, use some machinery like brush cutters, chainsaws, uh, sometimes a tractor um, with a, a flail on the back. And we also use contractors to clear scrub. Next slide, please. Uh, we don't just clear away everything um, because scrub is a valuable resource and individual um, hawthorn bushes, for example, are great places to spot thorn buntings. They love sitting and singing from hawthorn bushes. So we always leave uh, a few bushes um, for them. And also on the right, um, these are small egger moth caterpillars, which also feed on hawthorn and sometimes blackthorn. Um, so whilst we spend a lot of time cutting scrub, um, we always leave some as well. Next slide, please. And of course the berries um, in the autumn are a very important uh, source of food for the birds. So uh, we have lots of field fairs and red wings arriving in October and November and feasting on our berries, all from berries here, but also spindle and uh, the slows, of course, on the blackthorn. Next slide, please. And the scrub, the larger scrub blocks are very important for nesting birds and um, including the turtle dove, which will be arriving soon. It should be arriving on the down in next, well, certainly in the next month, I would say. Um, so yeah, and other, bird, other migratory birds, uh, the warblers, like the white throats, lesser white throat, um, caps, black caps, garden warblers, they're all utilizing the scrub to nest in. So um, it's a very important resource. Next slide, please. So our scrub blocks, we want to look a bit like this. We want them to be thick. We don't want them to be too tall with trees growing in them. They need to be dense, thick sort of areas of scrub, so almost impenetrable really, ideal for nesting in. Uh, and this is what we've got in uh, the area of the dam we call Church Hayes. Next slide, please. So when we cut scrub, um, sometimes we will treat the stumps with a herbicide. So on the left-hand side, this is some blackthorn. It was growing on the Bockley Dyke, uh, which was cut last winter, and then the stumps painted with a herbicide to prevent any regrowth. So that's what we'll do on grassland. But in the scrub blocks, when we cut scrub, we'll want it to regrow and we want it to regrow thickly with lots of stems coming up. So on the right, the stump there hasn't been treated uh, and it's allowed to regenerate, producing that thick growth. Next slide. So this is an area of scrub which has been cut. Um, if, you look at, if you look at the scrub at the back, you can see it's very tall and lanky and there's not much in the way of um, growth at a low level. It's, it, there's a sort of gap, if you like, developing at the base, which is not what we want. We, that's not very good for nesting birds. So the scrub blocks are cut on rotation. So an area of a block of scrub might be cut once every 20 years uh, and the stumps aren't treated, uh, they're allowed to regrow. Sometimes we might do a bit of laying so that right at the front here, 
uh, that scrub has been laid like you might lay a hedge again producing that sort of thick impenetrable sort of um, material uh, and the chap standing on the left of the screen now that is James my natural England colleague who you may see around if you visit the reserve next slide please so this this view gives you an idea of what we're looking for in terms of scrub we want blocks of scrub with grassland in between um, and this is an area in fact this is an area of chalk heath uh, where the soils are a bit more acid um, due to sort of post glacial deposits of gravel uh, and there are little patches of heather actually growing in here um, and the area sort of in the middle of the picture uh, was very overgrown with gorse which was cleared uh, a few years ago next slide please across the road in kit's grave was the area which was more or less left ungrazed for 50 or 60 years and the scrub has developed and secondary woodland is developing so there's a lot of hazel here and birch and ash um, we have though these sort of woodland rides running through it so this um, work party was clearing the ride making it wider to allow more light in to allow the plants to grow and uh, the insects to get some sunlight next slide please within kit's grave uh, we've been trying to open up the glades um, to, because there are actually some quite nice bits of grassland still remaining, despite the scrub having sort of um, regrown and taken over. Um, and we've sort of made a corridor up through Kit's grave by removing some of the scrub, which is allowing us to move animals up through uh, once a year. Uh, and these are the natural England sheep grazing after a bit of scrub clearance, it's a good idea to put the sheep on um, in the summer after you've cleared scrub in the winter because they'll nibble off some of that regrowth it might have been missed uh, with the herbicide treatment. Next slide, please. So this is a, an aerial photograph of Kit's grave. Uh, so you can see you can see the road line running along the bottom there. The large paddock there are the ones where we've introduced cattle now and the woodland area you can see these uh the glades so the sort of um sort of backwards c no the c-shaped the c-shaped glades going around to the left are the ones where we've been opening it up to allow the sheep in and there's a triangular paddock at the top which uh, is actually part of uh, Forestry Commission land, not owned by the Wildlife Trust or Natural England. Um, but we've included that in the management uh, now, and we were, we've started grazing that as well in order to um, encourage those, um, those plants. So uh, to make, improve the diversity of those swords, bringing the grazing back. Next slide, please. One of the challenges that we face on the down is uh, a grass called tor grass, Brachypodium pinnatum. And this is a picture of the tor grass in a paddock which has just been grazed. So you can see that despite being grazed, it's still there. The sheep haven't eaten it. The leaves of this grass contain a lot of silica, uh, which means that it's not very nice to eat, it's very tough uh, and unpalatable. And this, this grass, will, given the opportunity, will then spread and it will swamp out uh, well, pretty much anything else growing amongst it, given the chance. Um, next slide, please. So we're trying various different ways to control the tall grass. One obvious one is herbicide and patches have been sprayed with herbicide so you can see on the left it's, after it's been sprayed uh, the tall grass has died off on the right 
that dead grass is then raked off uh, and then uh, either um, seeds are allowed to germinate uh, that are sort of remaining in the seed bank, or in this case, which is part of a trial with CEH again, um, we've actually collected seed from the down uh, and used that to sow on those bare patches. So we're comparing sort of natural regeneration, if you like, with uh, an area where we've sowed seed and included in that seed mix is yellow rattle, which is a parasitic plant uh, or semi-parasitic plant. Uh, and that sort of takes some of its nutrients from the grasses. So we're hopeful that that may sort of um, reduce the regrowth of the tall grass and, and assist with control. Next slide, please. So after spraying, um, you can get some good results. On the left-hand side, this is an area that was sprayed. And then a couple of years later, you can see here um, in the, just in the middle of the picture towards the bottom, there is a burnt tip orchid has come through. Uh, there's cowslips there as well. Uh, other things perhaps not so welcome, there's a ragwort plant at the back, for example. But it shows that it, it can, it does work. Spraying the, rat, the tall grass off uh, allows other things to come through. So that's obviously persisted in the, in the sword and has been able to come through. On the right hand side, this is another area that was sprayed, uh, tall grass that was sprayed. And growing here, we've got basil thyme, which is really quite a rare plant. It's really a, a sort of arable weed. Uh, and um, it's taken advantage of that bare patch. There must have been seed in the soil uh, and it's come through. So it's really encouraging to see these sorts of results. Generally don't like to sort of spray herbicide around, but it can have good results. Um, another thing to mention with the tall grass is we do have um, other ways of managing it. So we have areas where we use a cut and collect machine towed behind the tractor, which cuts the tall grass and collects it, removing it from the site. Uh, and then we graze that about two or three weeks later and the animals are able then, they will eat the fresh new growth on the tall grass. And in that way, we're able to not get rid of it, but we're able to sort of keep it in check enough that it will coexist with the, wild, the other wildflowers that are growing there. And plant and grasses. Next slide, please. Another challenge, um, I'm afraid to say, is people. Uh, we do get a fair bit of fly tipping, which you, this is an example of. Uh, we also get problems with people off roading on the site. We get burnt out cars occasionally, and we get people coming and stealing batteries and fencing units from the electric fences um, and even destroying the, the barriers in the main car park. Uh, so a fair amount of antisocial behaviour. Um, next slide, please. Another issue uh, is dogs. Uh, we welcome dog walkers. They're very welcome to come on the reserve. Um, but we can have problems with dogs who are not kept under close control. Um, we often, well, usually most years we have one or two instances of sheep being chased or sometimes even uh, caught and either injured or killed by dogs. And we also have uh, many of our birds are ground nesting birds. So the grey partridge and the skylark, they make their nests on the ground. So dogs running free across the grassland, are at most, at least they're going to disturb those nests and maybe deter uh, the birds from coming back if they don't actually destroy them outright. So uh, we're very keen, especially at this time of year now, uh, when nesting is starting, that um, dog walkers keep their animals under close control. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a picture taken 
by the, the stop button on the, on the World War II rifle range, um, you can just about see the yellow flowers there. That's a, almost a carpet of horseshoe vetch. Um, when the, I mentioned before that the archaeology often provides the best sort of um, conditions for uh, the, well, the diverse plants to grow. So the richest flora is often found on the archaeology. But actually, the World War II uh, works don't quite count as archaeology yet, I don't think. Um, but actually, they're already producing the same sort of results. So the area in this picture is where the material was sort of scraped off from to produce the big stop butt there. So it's more or less, was more or less bare chalk. And this area contains probably the highest sort of species richness of plants on the reserve. It's, it, I mentioned the horseshoe vetch, um, and also things like frog orchid here, eye brights, um, pretty much most of the, the plants that we grow on the reserve grow here in, in sort of sort of miniature form, tiny little scabious plants and kidney vetch plants. And uh, it's a fantastic part of the reserve. But since World War II, there hasn't been many more of these sort of areas being produced. Next slide, please. So what we've started to do is, in a very small way, is make our own fresh sort of scrapes where we're exposing the bare chalk to allow that sort of uh, regeneration of those sort of um, areas. Otherwise, those areas will slowly probably uh, develop soils and become, uh, get more nutrients in and start to develop sort of taller, perhaps less interesting uh, plants. So this is an attempt to see if we can sort of restart that process. Next slide, please. I'm very pleased to say that um, Martin Down has a fantastic group of farmers uh, as neighbours, uh, and they formed a cluster of farmers who are sort of doing things on their farms uh, to help wildlife, to almost allow the the plants and animals on Martin Down to sort of brim over into the surrounding countryside. And uh, one of the things that uh, has happened is that uh, a pond was dug uh, on, this is Damon's farm in, in uh, Martin. And then the, the material that was ex excavated from the pond has been used to make a bank along the side here, a sort of curved bank, a butterfly bank in effect, um, and it's been sown with seed uh, collected on the reserve and also plug plants, things like kidney vetch. And I'm pleased to say that already last year, the kidney vetch was attracting small blue butterflies. So there really is, um, I think, well, I like the idea of sort of starting new features, almost new archaeology in a way, uh, is a really good idea and seems to be working. Uh, and farmers in the cluster are doing things like this. They're producing, they're making ponds for turtle doves to use. So they've got water throughout the year, uh, as, as well as providing flowery margins to their fields uh, and beetle banks and all that sort of thing, which is allowing wildlife to sort of spread out from Martin down. And a lot of the farms have actually got a lot of uh, interesting wildlife of their own, some of which doesn't occur on Martin Down as well. Next slide, please. So this map shows Martin Down in the middle, and uh, it's a map of triple SI, Sites of Special Scientific Interest. So you can see there are other triple SIs around Martin Down, like Hoyt Down and Pentridge Hill. Um, further away, there's Coombissit Down. So thinking beyond the reserve, there's an opportunity here. Uh, farmers are really interested now in doing things which will uh, help wildlife. There is an opportunity to connect these areas of uh, 
nature reserve really so so that um, the plants and the animals are able to spread out and colonize new areas by having by having sort of multiple populations if you like that it makes any individual population much safer um, the marsh fertility colony we have on Martin Down, for example, it's quite fragile. It, it, could, it could disappear at any time. And if there's not another population nearby, it won't come back. Whereas if, if there's another population a few miles away and it's linked with some you know, good habitat in between, then it can come back. So it makes the whole sort of uh, setup more stable. Next slide, please. I haven't mentioned chasing butterflies yet. No, counting butterflies. Um, this map shows a transect route in Kit's grave. So this is a butterfly transect uh, to give you an idea of, of what happened. So there are, um, in this transect, there are 12 sections and the route is walked once a week uh, from April through till the end of September uh, by either uh, myself, James, or in this case, the Kit's Grave one, uh, one of our volunteers, Chris Hill. Uh, it, it's, you have to walk, you walk along slowly and you have an imaginary tube in front of you, uh, like a tunnel, if you like, and you're counting the butterflies that are in that tunnel. So you must, this is two meters um, away. So anything within two meters as you walk that route, you're recording. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is a, on the left is a, one of the sheets that Chris has recorded on uh, from last year. So, um, and on the right is uh, a silver wash fertility of the uh, Valzina type, um, which is a sort of uh, a variation which occurs. Um, in fact, Chris found on his transect this summer uh, a wall brown, which was the first one that was found on the reserve since I think 1992, something like that. So we're hopeful that the wall might uh, become a, a regular feature and may establish itself here. It's a, a butterfly which has declined hugely in the past, well, probably three decades. Next slide, please. So uh, this is uh, a graph showing the results of uh, the transect counts for the north transect, which is one that goes along the Bockley Dyke. Um, and you can see that um, recording on this transect started in 1982 and has been continuous ever since. I think there was a gap in the year that there was foot and mouth disease, um, but otherwise it's a continual record. So it's a fantastic data set. This shows the, uh, the numbers of uh, the common blue, chalk hill blue, and Adonis blue. Um, just to give you an idea, um, you can see that they fluctuate hugely. We were worried actually about the chalk hill blue. If you look at the graph, it's the sort of dark blue. Uh, just a few years ago, it went down to virtually zero. And we were worried that, you know, we might be losing the chalk hill blue from the reserve. But luckily, in the past couple of years, it has bounced back. Um, and it seems to be sort of back on track. So the transects allow us to sort of check really that we're, uh, that our management is, um, is working uh, and that we're doing the right things. Next slide, please. So um, we, we've got six transects, uh, well, four on the reserve and two on neighboring land which are walked every week through the summer. And then we also have um, a couple of transects which are species specific, um, where we're only looking at one species, in this case, the marsh fertility, um, because we're particularly interested in that. Um, and this shows the numbers for the marsh fertility um, 
And again, as you can see, it goes up and down. And as I was saying, I mean, it wouldn't take too much for it to go to zero. Uh, and if there's not another colony uh, close by, then we could be in real trouble with this species. Next slide, please. Uh, we also uh, walk bumblebee transects recording bumblebees on the reserve. Um, it's a, Martin Down is a good site for bumblebees. It supports all of the common species, but also a number of the rarer ones, um, perhaps most notable um, being the uh, brown banded carder bee, Bombus humilis. Um, the picture here actually is of uh, a cuckoo bumblebee, um, Bombus rupestris, which parasitizes the nests of the very common Bombus lapidarius, uh, the red-tailed bumblebee. Next slide, please. We don't only count insects. Um, we're also uh, monitoring the, uh, the vegetation, the flowers. So uh, this is just one uh, of a number of rapid assessments that we do um, across the site. These involve so 20 random stops along a route where uh, there's a two meter, we have a two meter quadrat and we're looking at the presence or absence of this list of indicator species. So all of these species on this list are species which are indicative of good quality chalk grassland. Uh, so obviously we're looking to try and uh, encourage as many of these as possible. Uh, and by Doing these rapid assessments each year, we're able to see how we're getting on. So, uh, I mean, this is actually from this one here is from just south of the uh, the main road. So this is actually a bit of ground which was ploughed after the after the war, but actually is coming back quite nicely. Um, so, this is a useful sort of um, benchmark, if you like, for what we're trying to achieve across the other side of the road where the cattle are grazing. So, what we want to see. Uh, is an increase in the number of uh, times we encounter things like birds for trefoil and uh, fairy flax and rough hawkbit, which are present in very small numbers across the road, uh, but we want to increase that. Next slide, please. To finish off, I thought it might be nice to just uh, look at a few things which are around now on the down in case you're wanting, if you're in the area and you're um, going to go for a walk on the down uh, and what's sort of gonna be uh, up around quite soon. So um, this is the picture I took uh, last week um, showing uh, hairy violet, which is in flower now. Um, <clears throat> and actually the, the shell there, this is a dead one, but this is the brown lit snail, um, which are, all out and about mating at the moment. You'll see them all over the place mating. Next slide, please. This is quite a rare plant. Uh, this is um, dwarf sedge, which, although rare nationally, is actually really quite common on the down. You, you, most areas of the down you can find this, apart from where the grass is um, growing too tall. Um, so most areas of short grass and have got some of this growing in it and it's flowering now. Next slide, please. It won't be long until we start to see the early purple orchid, which is on the left, um, which has uh, spotted leaves. And on the right uh, is a marsh artillery caterpillar. Um, in a few weeks time, you'll start to see these wandering around a lot across the tracks. They'll, the marsh artillery is a communal uh, caterpillar. It, ha it has webs containing hundreds of little caterpillars, um, but they break up at this time of year and the individual caterpillars wander off and find somewhere to pupate. Uh, and then come May and middle to end of May, uh, those pupae will hatch out into the adult butterflies. Next slide, please. 
we also, it's a good time to see oil beetles um, now and into April. Um, you often find them wandering across paths and tracks. Um, they have an interesting life history. Um, they, they lay their eggs uh, and they hatch out into these tiny little larvae called triungulans. And they climb up onto uh, a flower head and they'll wait for a solitary bee to come along. Uh, they'll grab hold of it and hitch a ride back to the solitary bee's nest that it'll be provisioning with eggs and pollen. They'll jump off and they will then feed as a parasite on those eggs and the food stores, uh, hatching out, uh, or sorry, pupating and then hatching out as the adult beetles and emerging later in the year. On the right hand side is a, a, a parasitic bee, a cuckoo bee, if you like, um, Sphacodes, uh, which parasitizes solitary bees. And it um, really just emphasizing the value that paths and tracks have on the reserve. Um, often criticized for being muddy and rutted, but um, they provide habitat for solitary bees to nest in. Uh, and that's really quite important. Um, another thing, actually, the paths and tracks uh, support um, populations of the red bartsia plant, which loves those sort of compacted soils. Uh, uh, there's a solitary bee which feeds only on the pollen of red bartsia, uh, Melitta trisincta. Next slide, please. On the left is a bee fly. This is a fly, not a bee, um, but it's a mimic of a bee. And it lays its eggs uh, around the sort of entrances to solitary bee nests. And the uh, larvae then go into those nests and feed on the, the solitary bee eggs and food reserves uh, in the same way as the oil beetle does. Butterflies are emerging now, brimstones are out on the down, and when we get into April, back end of April, we should start to see the grizzled skipper pictured here. Next picture, please. Next slide. Ah, oh. Perhaps uh, the, my favorite solitary bee would have to be uh, Osmia bicolor, which is the red-tailed mason bee. And this is it's not a very good video, but there is a video here which um, shows a female uh, red-tailed mason bee sort of building its nest. But they, my first encounter with these was uh, when I was collecting snail shells on the down for a school project. And uh, I put a snail shell in my pocket and then there was a tremendous buzzing coming from my pocket. And I pulled out the, the snail shell and emerging from it were some solitary bees and they were Osmia bicolor. What they do is they, they nest inside or they lay their eggs inside the empty snail shells on the down. And, uh, but not only that, once they've, they've done that, they will then, they then, uh, collect grass stems and bring them back and cover up the snail shell. And that's what this bee is doing. You see them sometimes flying around with uh, bits of grass sort of two, three centimeters long. It's quite impressive to see. Uh, and they'll be on the, they'll be on the down in a, in a few weeks time, sort of middle of April to the end of April, they usually start to appear. And uh, they continue flying through the first part of the summer. They love the horseshoe vetch flowers on the Boccoli Dyke. Must be getting towards the end. I'm starting to lose my voice. Uh, next slide, please. And this is my last slide. So uh, we started at the northern end of the reserve, looking south from the rifle range. We're now at the southern end of the reserve, at the Blagdon Gap. Uh, looking up Bockley Dyke towards uh, the rifle butts there and the main road. Um, I have to say I feel very lucky to be doing the job that I'm doing. Uh, 
on Martin Down. It's a fantastic uh, place to work. And uh, I should also thank all the other people involved in managing the reserve. That includes all the graziers, the commoners, volunteers, uh, and people who are working for Natural England and my colleagues at the Countryside Service. So I will stop there. Thank you to Mike Fussell for presenting this talk as part of the Spring Talk series, hosted by the Chase and Chalk Landscape Partnership Scheme. Thank you to our partners and funders for this talk, 